Today, in this series on clinical reasoning, I'll be discussing 10 common errors in diagnostic reasoning. Essentially, what are some of the specific cognitive errors that clinicians can make which lead to misdiagnoses? I'm not asserting that these are the 10 most common or most important, just that they are mistakes that I've seen many trainees and experienced clinicians make over the years and which I've made for myself from time to time. The list will touch on many of the concepts from earlier videos in this series and can be seen as a bit of a summary to consolidate an understanding of some of the concepts and terms learned so far before the series shifts to discussing the more challenging quantitative analyses of these topics. I'll be talking about the errors roughly in the order in which one might commit them during a patient encounter and subsequent reasoning process. First up is a failure to perform an indicated component of the physical exam. Clinicians become conditioned very early to perform a remarkably similar exam on every patient, irrespective of medical history or presenting symptoms. That is, every patient who comes to the hospital or urgent care clinic with an acute problem receives the same cranial nerve exam, brief visual examination of the oral cavity, heart and lung auscultation, a cursory assessment for abdominal tenderness, and evaluation of leg edema. It doesn't matter if the patient is presenting with septic shock or an ingrown toenail, they all seem to get the same exam. And when every patient ends up getting more or less the same exam, we never learn how to consider exam maneuvers as individual diagnostic tests, which is what we should be doing. We should have a preliminary differential diagnosis in our heads after the history, and then consciously decide which exam maneuvers are truly indicated based on the pretest probability of the relevant diseases and a general idea of the test performance characteristics for that aspect of the exam. But few of us do that, at least not without very deliberate conscious thought that's not replicated on every patient. What are some particularly common inappropriate omissions? A back exam, a thorough neuro exam, including a gait assessment, a lymph node exam, and a skin exam in regions not otherwise exposed. The next error is a poorly constructed or entirely absent summary statement or assessment. While the assessment is often thought of as primarily a means of communicating one's thoughts to colleagues, it also serves a critical function in helping the clinician to choose the most appropriate diagnostic framework for a case, to identify its most important key features, and to select the most relevant illness scripts for comparison. Some specific common errors. The summary statement is a word-for-word -word restatement of the chief complaint, which of course is useless. Inclusion of details of minimal relevance to the differential diagnosis. For example, Ms. Patel is a 65-year-old woman with a history of hypothyroidism, osteoporosis, gout, and a hiatal hernia, who is now presenting with three days of fever, dysuria, and right flank pain. The inclusion of distractors hinders the identification of the most notable key features. The summary statement lacks semantic qualifiers. The use of semantic qualifiers improves the clinician's ability to match case presentations to illness scripts. Or the summary statement lacks any synthesis of findings. So one might report that a patient is presenting with the acute onset of jaundice, confusion, and abdominal distension, with asterisks on exam and labs notable for a bilirubin of 20 and an INR of 3, instead of reporting that the patient is presenting with acute liver failure. Such an error might lead the clinician to focus at this step on the differential diagnosis of jaundice, or th that of confusion, rather than realizing that the data is overwhelmingly consistent with acute liver failure. Focusing the differential diagnosis for that specific problem will get to the answer more quickly. Next, the illness script for a relevant disease lacks atypical presentations. Atypical presentations of common diseases are seen more frequently than typical presentations of rare diseases. Therefore, Excluding those at the earliest stages of training, having insufficiently complete illness scripts committed to memory is a more common source of error 
than having knowledge of an insufficient number of scripts. Anchoring bias. This is one of the most common forms of cognitive bias in medicine. Unfortunately, it's variably defined, but I think the most useful of definitions is when a clinician focuses too much on one feature of the presentation, usually one learned relatively early in the evaluation. For example, if one is seeing a patient with shortness of breath and cough and learns that the person recently returned from travel abroad, and then considers only those diagnoses that are specifically associated with that country. Or if one is seeing a patient presenting with acute abdominal pain and learns that the person had an episode of loose stool a week ago, subsequently limiting one's differential diagnosis to only those diagnoses in which diarrhea is a prominent feature. In both of these examples, the element of the history to which the clinician anchored, the travel and the diarrhea, they are worthy of being key features. That is, they certainly aren't irrelevant. So consideration of them isn't anchoring bias until that consideration is strong enough to lead to the excessive exclusion of other plausible diagnoses. The next common error, the differential diagnosis is too long. This is common among the earlier trainees, such as medical students on their first clinical rotation. This usually occurs due to the conflation of the relevant diagnostic framework for the primary symptom in general and the patient-specific differential diagnosis. Remember from the video on frameworks and differentials that a framework incorporates only the chief symptom of the patient's presentation, no other data, is routinely 20 items or longer, is organized by organ system or physiologic mechanism, and is static, while the differential diagnosis incorporates all of the available information from the person's history, exam and tests, is closer to four to six items in length, is listed in descending order of probability, and is updated with each new piece of information. The problem with excessively long differentials is that it makes it impossible to prioritize tests, which can lead to a tendency to excessively test for anything even remotely plausible. The opposite of this also occurs when a differential diagnosis is too short. This is common among later stage trainees, such as interns. It occurs usually due to either a lack of time or from momentum bias in which a previously suggested diagnosis is uncritically accepted as probable. It can also be due to an overestimation of the significance of a test result. For example, in a patient presenting with chronic progressive shortness of breath, if an echocardiogram finds a diastolic relaxation abnormality, the clinician might incorrectly assume that this relatively nonspecific finding must indicate the patient has diastolic heart failure. Next is base rate neglect. This is the failure to incorporate the prevalence of a disease into diagnostic reasoning. So treating every disease on the differential diagnosis as if it occurs with equal frequency in the population to which the patient belongs. In early learners, the most common way in which this manifests is by placing excessive weight on rare diagnoses which had received emphasis during school that is disproportionate to their prevalence, usually because they are prototypical examples of a disease mechanism or demonstrate another basic science principle. In experienced clinicians, a common way in which base rate neglect manifests is by placing excessive weight on rare so-called don't miss diagnoses. This doesn't mean that rare don't miss diagnoses should not be investigated, but rather that if they are investigated, it should be with the understanding that the diagnosis is unlikely and that subsequent test results are interpreted with that in mind. The next error is a little like the opposite of base rate neglect, at least in its consequence. While base rate neglect usually results in excessive emphasis placed on a rare diagnosis, one can also err on prematurely ruling out a rare diagnosis. I've heard this error referred to as zebra retreat because the clinician initially thinks of a so-called zebra diagnosis as a potential diagnosis, but then runs away from it for some reason. This could be because the clinician doesn't want to be seen as wasteful of resources or because working up the rare diagnosis is unusually cumbersome and challenging in that particular clinical environment, 
or because the primary clinician perceives a challenge in getting buy-in from the subspecialist whose procedural expertise will be needed for confirmatory evidence. And sometimes, a zebra retreat may be a consequence of the clinician deliberately compensating for base rate neglect, but overshooting. Clinicians can order tests that won't change management, or put in other terms, order tests in which neither a positive nor negative result would cross either a testing or treatment threshold. This error does not lead to misdiagnosis per se, but it is wasteful of money and resources. Common tests to be inappropriately ordered for this reason, BNP in a patient who will be treated for heart failure regardless of a low result, procalcitonin in a patient who will be given antibiotics regardless of the result, D-dimer in a patient for whom the clinician has already made up their mind as to whether a CT angiogram is needed to rule out a PE, and last, ammonia in a patient with suspected hepatic encephalopathy. To be clear, all of these tests have important and appropriate indications, it's just that they are frequently ordered for reasons outside of those indications. And this list, of course, excludes routine daily labs in stable hospitalized patients, which is a whole other discussion. And the last error I'll discuss today is related to base rate neglect. When clinicians do not sufficiently consider the pretest probability when applying the results of a diagnostic test. In other words, having a post-test probability that's independent of the pretest probability which can occur when the clinician treats all items on the differential as having grossly similar probabilities. This results in either prematurely ruling in a diagnosis with a low pretest probability following a positive test, or prematurely ruling out a diagnosis with a high pretest probability following a negative test. That's my list of 10 common diagnostic errors. I won't read through the list, but it's here if you'd like to pause the video and review it. As mentioned at the beginning, it isn't meant to be the top 10 errors, just ones that I've come across frequently.